um, today. Um, somebody is praying for you, and you can see the results. I'm going to tell you something, folks. When two or more are gathered in your name, everything, everything comes through. So um, let's sing it again. Just, just a prayer. nice is that song I'm gonna tell you well you know my favorite author in these magazines is my friend and um, he always gives us a good story and that's Dick Dirksen so if you read it this week in your what book is this again the journey Adventist journey I got a little change up on it because I'm gonna tell you something can you hear me okay so I want to make sure you can hear me. Um, it's a story about an Adventist pastor who gets a call from his wife telling him, don't come home. <laughs> right. Says, Betty's voice was clear and direct. Jim, I can't live with you anymore. You need to be out of the house before I get off work today. It was Friday and things had been going well for Jim and Betty, a young Adventist pastoral couple. Betty was finished with their marriage and Jim didn't understand why. Can you imagine that? He didn't understand why. No offense to men, but you know what women want? They just want you to hold their hand. They want you to encourage them. They want you to say, I love you. These little tiny things, guess what? That's all we want. <laughs> Believe me. Then if we're having trouble with the kids, take one, play with them for a while to give her a little break. That, basically, that's our need, you know? And to just know that you're, we're loved. So obviously, Jim wasn't doing something right, right? It says, uh, maybe does this... Uh, uh, Ignore her pleads for attention, it sounds like. I thought we had a typical marriage, a relationship, he remembers, but now the worst thing I could ever imagine was happening, and I didn't even understand what I had done. They're the last to know. Most men are the last to know. I'm sorry, but I just, I just think about that. But no, it really cracked me up and said typical. Sometimes you can use this as the same idea with your relationship with God. Is your relationship with God just typical? Or are you having a, a real relationship? I think this is what was going on in her marriage. Here he was, a minister, and he was in the Word. But was the Word feeding him if he couldn't even see that his marriage was, was in trouble? He was, he was in need right there. As says, Jim called the hospital chaplain, asked him to take care of the sermon he was preaching the next day. Then he got into his old RV, headed south. Some hiking on the Pacific Coast Trail would help to clear his head. He hoped he'd spent a fitful night, uh, oh, he hoped. He then spent a fitful night parked near some railroad track Sabbath morning took him further south. How is our relationship with God? Is it typical? Do we need to take time to go away and think it through and see what's going on in our relationship? Then all of a sudden, the transmission made a few terrible screeching sounds and seized up. It took a while, but a truck finally came. 
uh, to pick up the, uh, the RV to a local transmission shop where the mechanic quickly analyzed it and gave the gym the news. It can be repaired, but we're close at noon today, so you won't be able to get it back until Monday. Until then, you can camp right here in the parking lot if you'd like. So, that night, a gang riot broke out in the parking lot surrounding the RV with gunshots, shouting, squealing tires, sirens, fearful for his life. Jim spent most of the night lying on the floor of the tiny motorhome, quietly crying to God. You know, when we're in trouble, who likes to make things worse? right when well, we're in the doubt of our lives but you know sometimes God allows something to happen to give us some faith right there so uh, um, I said I wrote down something oh getting back on track isn't always easy when we think we're when we need to get back with God is it Satan will always throw a curveball right in there he said, Sunday morning, Pastor Jim woke up feeling that he needed to be in church, any church. It was Sunday, but he began walking around just down the street. He heard enthusiastic Christians, music coming from this place. The sign in front of the church said, Victory Outreach. As he stepped into the small chapel, he quickly realized that people were nothing like the people he attended to in his large church back at home. Jeans, t-shirts, tattoos, piercings, the church seemed to be targeting addicts and street walkers. They were singing at the top of their lungs and praising and loving and forgive and um, praising and loving and worshiping God. Why were these people so boisterous and so full of song? Because when you're forgiving most, you're going to praise more. You're going to be closer to God. He saw this difference. A lot of times we don't think uh, we're in, a, in some kind of a state where we forget where God has brought us or we think somebody else is worse than, uh, no, we're all sinners. Amen. And these people here really knew how to praise God. You know why? Because they knew what they had done and that what they were forgiven. Look, we've done the same thing. We might not have been a prostitute, but we've done a lot more, <laughs> more things, evil things, all right? So I love that they were singing. So as the music uh, soaked into the soul, Jim began to weep uncontrollably. The members seemed to sing louder to cover the sounds of his sobbing. And Jim knew God had led him right there because he needed to be uplifted. You know, we, that's why we come to church. That's why sometimes when we're in here, we don't sing. I want everybody to sing and say, thank you, Jesus, for loving me so much. And praise him. When the service was over, he caught the attention of a woman in a pew in front of him. He said, I'm in terrible trouble. He said, is there someone I could talk to? Just a moment, she said. A few minutes later, a young deacon came over and sat down beside him. As Jim, Jim sobbed out his story, the man listened deeply. When Jim paused, the deacon spoke directly to his heart. There is something I don't understand. How could a Christian pastor permit his marriage to get so bad that his wife would rather live without him? And the question was shocking. You don't understand, he said. She's the one who kicked me out of the house. I didn't have a choice. Blame. Do we blame others for our mistakes? Do we? I know sometimes I say, Ron, but then I realize it's not Ron, it's me. So I have to learn that. The deacon persisted, you can't fix anything here. What's broken is back there. You need to go home. Start again, go home, go home to Jesus. Amen. That's when we get in trouble, that's where we need to go. Uh, this story speaks louder than words. Outside, Jim began to wander around the town, walking, thinking, pondering what he had just heard that man say and the experience that he just had. Tears were coming down his face. Later that morning, Pastor Jim's walking took him to a local hospital, air conditioning, that's what he needed. Sat in the lobby, started to read a few magazines, 
And then he slipped in, knelt beside one of the chairs and into the chapel and prayed, seeking peace and understanding. After a time, a quiet solitude, he rose. As he started to leave the chapel, he noticed a binder for prayer request. I am a Christian pastor, he wrote. My wife has just kicked me out of the house. Please pray for me. Then he signed his name, Pastor Jim. Monday morning, mechanics pulled the old RV into the garage and began the major surgery on the transmission. Jim went walking and sobbing and thinking. He ended up back at that hospital chapel and he started praying again. And he heard the, the um, chaplain in the office. And when he went in there, he said, come on, he knocked on the door, he said, come on in. He said, I walked in, sat down, wiped my soggy eyes. When I looked up, I saw a kind face, a man reaching for a box of tissues. He said, Re um, how can I help you? I'm Pastor Jim, he said. You're Pastor Jim? And he's thinking, how does this guy know me? I don't know him. Who knows us better than anybody? Jesus knows us better than anybody. He hears those cries more than anybody else. But I like this. He says, well, yes. I'm Jim, I said, bewildered. Before you say a single word, Jim, I want you to know something. Every Christian pastor in this area is praying for you. We had a prayer breakfast and I showed them your request and they all took it and they're all praying. Jim could hardly believe what he was hearing. God had orchestrated an amazing gift. All of heaven, when we get away from God. It made me think it took three days for his transmission to get fixed. Sometimes it takes us three days to get back with God, doesn't it? For him to sink in and tell us what we've done wrong. And you know what? Everybody in heaven is pleading with us to come back. He doesn't leave. I just love that. But he, uh, he said, uh, for your name was in the morning message and everyone is praying for Jim. Jim could hardly believe it. There is an unfamiliar city far from the home of all Christian, all the Christian pastors were calling out to God on my behalf. Jim and the chaplain prayed and talked together. Finally, the chaplain said to him, Jim, you need to go home. You can't fix this. What's broken in your marriage from here? I just recognized the council and knew that he needed what he needed to do, but he was terrified to follow through with the words. What if she, I called and she hung up on me? But at the transmission shop, guess what? That small voice kept saying to him, you can't fix this here. You need to go home. When we're broken, we need to go home. We need to go home to Jesus because he's the only one that can fix our broken hearts. I'm sorry. All right. <coughs> Finally, he went into the office, used the phone, and he said, called the church because he knew his kids would be at Pathfinder and his wife would be there. And you know what she said to him? Come home. Hallelujah. Come home. Hallelujah. So if you're lost, don't wait. Just go home. He's waiting for you. Right, and now we're going to have our worship, the great controversy, and it's Pastor Roger Morton, wherever you are. Is he here today? He's here. Oh, good. Thank you for such a touching devotion. But you know how emotional I get when I read stuff. But you know what? This touched my heart because I think of all the people that don't realize they just have to go home. He's waiting there for them. That's why we have these meetings. Amen. These meetings are such a blessing. They are. Let's have a prayer. Yes. Let's pray. Dear Father, we love you so much. You're always wooing us to you. You love us so much. There's nothing you wouldn't do to save us. Help us, Father, to remember that and to trust you with our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks again, Lily.
Sabbath school, good morning. Good morning, good morning. You know I love to go down the aisles. I see Mary Leon, um, Robert, Mom, Evelyn, um, Jackie, Steve, um, Brother Paul Moore, um, Kathy that has lost her sister, and we've been praying for her, and our dear Assistant Superintendent Lily, Thank you again for that message. And then Lourdes and David. I see, um, I don't know this couple's name. Mike, yes, yes, thank you for coming. And then we're privileged today to have with us um, Elder Olin Thomas. Thank you for um, choosing to worship with us today. And our dear little Mary Lou in the back there, happy to see you, my dear sister. And then Marguerite, Marguerite, good morning. Yes, and then our, um, our dear sister who leads out in prayer, the prayer session, um, Sister Angela Robinson. And David, it's nice to see you. Thanks for making, pushing yourself to come. And, um, and Glenda, thank you. Daryl, our dear friend, please remind me of your name. David, another David, thank you for being so faithful um, to Sabbath school and church, Sabbath after Sabbath. Heaven brags on you that you will show up, yes? We praise God for that. Dear John, thank you for your faithfulness as well. Manly, thank you, thank you for all that you're doing. And um, Philna and Paul, for your faithfulness these past three weeks in learning about God, and expanding your knowledge base, we praise God. And our other assistant superintendent, Margaret. Brothers and sisters, I greet you. Pardon, whom did I leave out? Oh, Barbara. Where's your shadow? Where's your shadow? <laughs> She's ill. Okay. Brothers and sisters, I greet you in the name of Jesus. And I am excited, as always, to share the love of Jesus with each of you. Thank you for valuing Sabbath School, the church at study, where we can learn and grow from each other. Today, we are equally privileged to have another pastor from the Ocala Church to share his um, insights with us on this lesson study, Love or Selfishness? He is none other than Pastor Roger Morton. We welcome you to the Donnellan Church and thank you for your selflessness in being here with us. That's my privilege, that's for sure. Amen. I appreciate the privilege of being here. Amen. You know, particularly with this lesson, you know, this, the, the writer of the lesson, the one who developed the lesson, was Mark Finley. Oh, yeah. And um, you may not realize it, but I was public relations director for It Is Written when Mark Finley was the speaker director there. So it was, you know, I have enjoyed already this lesson. We're in lesson number two. Um, but, you know, it's, I can say one thing, and that is that Mark Finley, in my opinion, is not only a good speaker and a good preacher, but he's a good Christian, and a godly man. I became quite well acquainted with him while, well, as you might imagine, I was the public relations director for It Is Written those years that he was there. And it, uh, it always amazed me the graciousness that he had towards his employees. And uh, it was a good experience. Now, um, as was mentioned her here, 
Sabbath school is the time that we meet together for cross-pollination. Is this coming through? Okay, cross-pollination. And that assumes that you're willing to share, not just sit there silently. I was here last night, and the preacher was preaching valiantly, and I enjoyed his message, but everyone was absolutely quiet. Uh, well, that's the way it's supposed to be, I suppose. <laughs> but not during Sabbath school. Sabbath school is our time for cross-pollination, for sharing. Uh, you may wonder if you have anything to contribute, but you do. <laughs> and uh, so I, I will give you an opportunity. To, we've had prayer, and I want to once again invite the Holy Spirit to <clears throat> indwell this service and our discussion. Father in heaven, you know our needs. You know our desires to represent you aright. You know the learning points that each person here has. So I pray that you will make this Sabbath school and church that will follow a, a point of spiritual growth for each of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, does everyone have a quarterly? Now, our good sister here traveled up to the camp to bring extra quarterlies. Uh, it looks like we, we need some quarterlies. Quarterly, what a, why, what a strange name for this little booklet. Um, well, you know, Seventh-day Adventists kind of divide the year into quarters so that the first three months of the year, we were studying the book of Psalms. That was the quarterly message theme for that. This quarters will go for April, May, and June. So this quarter we were thinking about the great controversy. That's an overall theme that we have for this quarter. So we have a, a booklet that you just received and I assume that the other members, do you all, could you raise your quarterly? I, I see we have it throughout the room so that we're here so that we can share together the memory text. I just wanted to make sure everyone was on the right page here. Uh, it's found in Isaiah 41.10 Let's share it together. I will start, but join in with me as we read the memory text. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, who is that speaking? Whoa. Why do you think we have at the beginning of each lesson a memory text? Well, maybe the author, in this case Mark Finlay, <coughs> felt that this was a text that we should, should put in our memories. I mean, it's a beautiful text, and if you haven't memorized this text, this week, I would suggest that later today that you, you know, it was easier to memorize when we were 10 years old. Yes, sir, you have a, a, an observation. It's Hooray! In, we're cross-pollinating, man. It's yes. interesting in that verse how many eyes yeah. I have eyes. Yeah, so that similar God was to personalizing Satan. Yeah, that's this, similar this to promise. Satan. He says, I will, I will, I will. Absolutely. So we have to decide which of these eyes will follow. Well, 
Are you suggesting we should follow all of them? No. No? He said decide. I will be with you. I am your God. Now, there's two positives. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I think we ought to embrace all of those eyes. <laughs> Excuse me for a slight disagreement there, but uh, did you have a, a reason you thought we ought to choose one over the other? Well, it seems like it's easier to follow the other eye because of the word self. Sin mm. is self at its worst. So, what we are saying is that we have to choose between self and God to direct us. We're either going to be self-directed or we're going to be God-directed. And uh, I think that's a point well taken. Okay. Now, the, the author, Mark Finley, my beloved former boss, uh, used a hypothetical illustration. He, he suggested we would imagine that we were uh, simple people listening in on a message that Jesus was primarily giving to his disciples and he was saying, Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not all be thrown down. Now, what was he referring to? The temple at Jerusalem. Now, we have an image of the Temple Mount at Jerusalem, and on it now is a, a Muslim shrine. But what he was talking about was not Solomon's Temple. You know, uh, one of the wonders of the ancient world. But in fact, after the the time that they spent in Babylon, they rebuilt the Temple and it was still <coughs> magnificent, wasn't it? <coughs> and just recently, Herod had upgraded the <coughs> temple with, with many refinements so that the, new t the second temple that replaced Solomon's temple had become even more magnificent. And, and it says that as they looked on the the white marble walls it was impressive and those were the stones the marble were the stones that this new rebuilt temple probably based upon the original stones that Solomon had used and how could Christ predict I mean, have you ever uh, seen an ancient temple? Those stones were not, you know, little. <laughs> they, were, they were big stone. If you had been there, would you, as the, as the author of the lessons suggested, wondered how this could ever, ever happen? I think we would all agree but, did it happen? Yeah, it happened because there had been an Old Testament prophecy, 70 weeks of years, 490 years, are determined upon your people, uh, separated away from the bigger prophecy of, of eight, uh, 1290, uh, 60 years coming to conclusion in 1844 but there was there was a time when God's Israel people of Israel were within the selected frame of God but 
something happened during that time that disqualified them, right, from being God's chosen people. When do you think that happened? Think about it. When do you think something happened that caused God to realize that these people that he had loved so preciously had in fact gone astray and were no longer representing him in the world. Yes? Yeah, right, sir. Oh, oh I see. We if, have a... If you remember... Point. If you remember, they said, we have one king, and that is Caesar. So they gave up the heavenly king for the earthly king. But if we should go back up, way back before, when the Israelites said, we want a king. We want to be like the rest of the world. Everybody around us have a king. We need a king. But was Jesus their king? Yeah, but they refused him there too. And then at the stoning of Stephen, they finally gave up everything. Yeah, because Stephen had pointed out the presence of the true Messiah among them, right. yeah. and they still rejected him. So, in fact, the children, what we call the children of Israel, had, by their own choices, disqualified themselves from the divine protection and had God ever protected them oh, many times but what was coming they were without protection and that is a fearful thing you know what's coming with for us is a time of trouble such as never been and what do we need to f as we face that time of trouble? The that protection of the divine, right. right? And how do we have the protection of the divine? Learn from Israel, how do we maintain and retain the protection from God? By following God. By following him, by obedience. Yeah. Uh, it, it's that was that the message last night yeah yeah we need to be willing to follow God wherever he leads us in our lives and be true to him now um, would someone be willing to read Luke 19 well actually I, I have in my notes that I was going to read that. Whoa, why? I wanted to share something. This is entitled The Clear Word. Now, there's something unique about this Bible that's different from the Bible that you probably have in your hands. And that is the difference between a translation and a paraphrase. This is a paraphrase. Now, a paraphrase is based upon the, the original understandings of the person who made the paraphrase. So if they had misunderstandings about God's word and they were putting into their terms what they think the original languages are making, it would go in various directions based upon their their backgrounds. Uh, the reason that I am going to read from the paraphrase because I want you to look at your Bible, Luke 19, starting with verse 41. Open your Bibles and compare as I read this passage. Let's see if we can get it open here. Luke 19, verses 
41. Well, here we are. <clears throat> the reason I'd like for you to look, I, I'd like you to see how close this paraphrase is to the translations that you have in your your lap, either the King James Version or the New King James Version or the New American Standard Version or the Revised Standard and so forth. As the procession came in sight of Jerusalem and Jesus saw the city, he stopped and wept, saying, O oh, Jerusalem, if you only knew what peace you have rejected and that this is your last chance, but you, you're still so blind. Your hopes will never be realized. The time will soon come when you, your enemies will surround you and build siege ramps, ramps against your walls and close in on you from all sides. They won't give up until they conquer you. Flatten the buildings inside your temple so that not one stone will be left upon the other. There's our memory verse. They will have no mercy, even the children. And all of this will happen because you did not recognize what God was trying to do for you. Then he urged the donkey towards forward and the procession moved on into the city with people shouting and chanting until they reached the temple. There, Jesus stopped, got off the donkey, and went inside. He ordered those who bought and sold animals at a huge profit to get out. He said to them, it is written in the scriptures, my house is a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a gathering place for thieves. The next few days, Jesus taught openly in the temple, and the chief priests, the teachers, and the leaders determined to have him arrested and taken to Pilate to be executed. But because the people were listening to every word he said, and many of them were being healed, the leaders found it difficult to have Jesus arrested. Now, did you notice that there were slight variations? Mm -hmm. You know, the King James Version, uh, most of us grew up on the King James Version, uh, and we developed two vocabularies. One was the modern English vocabulary, which we learned as kids growing up, and <laughs> we had to learn a second vocabulary, which was the King James vocabulary, Shakespearean, you know. Uh, why? Because since 1511, amazingly, not really, uh, the English language had shifted. Uh, I mean, there were new phrases that came into usage, and there were old phrases that no longer had the same meaning, so that the King James Version had to be read like with an understanding of how originally would have meant. And then modern translations began to appear, like the New King James Version, which the, the committee that did the King James originally in 1511 were very carefully, and that translation stood the test of time for hundreds of years. But then a new committee, also devout and knowledgeable in the original Hebrew and, and Greek, were charged with the opportunity to up, upgrade the King James Version into usages that were current in that time when that was happening, so that they tried to leave the King James as much as possible as it was originally translated. But there were changes in the English language that caused them to 
to word things in some texts slightly differently. Um, nevertheless, it still has the familiar ring of the King James that we all grew up on. And that's why I have here the uh, New King James. And yet, for study, this is the, the, the Word of God that I, I use in my study and preparation of sermons and so forth. But for plain devotional reading, this paraphrase that Dr. Blanco, you know, he, he uh, was in the Second World War a prisoner. And instead of spending his time complaining, <laughs> he spent a lot of his time <clears throat> studying the books that he was allowed to have of the, of the Bible. And later, as he became chairman of the Department of Religion at Southern Adventist University, he thought, you know, I think I would like to create something that my grandkids would appreciate. Something a little more simple, straightforward. You noticed as I read it, it varied here and there, but it was maybe a little more simple. And so he began the, the clear word as an attempt to paraphrase the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. First came out, I remember, in the New Testament, then in the Old Testament. And it, it became something that children would follow more easily than the old King James and even the modern King James. So enough of that. So, how are we coming? Well, would someone read? Oh, I've read that. Okay. I think we have illustrated why God allowed the temple and the, and the children of Israel to no longer represent him as his primary representatives in the world. It was because they had totally rejected him. And they said, like he said, do you want me to crucify your king? And they said, we have no king but Caesar. And, uh, and they actually, they struck their death nail in their complete rejection of Jesus Christ because it was the actual creator God who was among them and they they killed him they rejected him totally and that continued to be true even in his witnesses as was pointed out even in the stoning of Stephen who had given a powerful uh, evidence of his his uh, Christ divinity we have a comment hooray oh. Well, um, okay, so you're saying that the death nail came at the death of Christ, um, but the 70-year prophecy, doesn't that go uh, beyond that, another yeah, three and a half yeah, years? Another three and a half years. So God's probation was still uh, extended or open or whatever word you want to use. Yeah, I, um, your point is well taken because the death of Christ, which for us is the keynote of our trust in him because it demonstrated his love so completely, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there were a lot of people who weren't, were not there when that happened on, the, on Golgotha. And so the, Israel as a whole was given a, an additional time period for the truth and our lesson was bringing out you know the early Christians were not hesitant about sharing the truth about Christ and for three and a half years they they shared the truth about Christ 
the risen Savior, the one who had come, who had died for them, who had gone, returned to heaven. And so when, when, when they rejected the message of, of Stephen and stoned him, it was symbolic of the fact that the major not all, because thousands were converted, 3,000, 5,000 is coming up shortly in our, in our study. But they became a nucleus of children of God who were now the progenitors, the proclamators of the gospel and were a part of that progression of people, we believe, who through the centuries have maintained a purity of thought towards God. And um, so what Israel lost has been a source of gain to anyone worldwide who accepted Christ as their savior and, and became united with him. You have a, additional thoughts? I mean, <laughs> well, I'm not sure where you want to go with the rest of the lesson. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we have some important things to. Basically, the children of Israel gave up their, I guess, their right. Uh, I don't even know if that's the right word, but to be the ambassadors, like solely for God's kingdom. So after the stoning of Stephen, the Gentiles were given that right. Is that the right word? <laughs> Yeah, uh, to be his ambassadors. Is well, that basically it, the crux of the, uh, the thing is that word Gentile is, is understood as non-Jew. But many of the early church were Jews by ancestry. In fact, my great grandmother was a member of a Jewish family um, and she passed down her Jewishness to her daughter my grandmother who passed down her Jewishness according to the Jewish reckoning to my mother who passed it down to me unfortunately I can't pass it down to my sons because that's passed down in their thinking through the mother so I'm one sixteenth Jewish, but actually my citizenship is in heaven because of my commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and not my ancestry. So, you know, um, I don't boast that I am one sixteenth Jewish. Nonetheless, it's true, I am. Nevertheless, I love the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came and saved me by his own blood at the cross. Now, did, did Christ love those who responded to his great sacrifice? How do we know that Christ loved those who responded to his great sacrifice? Because of what he did for them. Pardon? Because of what he did for them. Yes, that's true. And we find in the lesson he gave a prediction, yes? The, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what he gave them. Yeah, he gave them the Holy Spirit to represent him. And through earlier, while he was still here, he gave in Matthew 24 some very specific directions as to what they should do at the time 
that Jerusalem was to be destroyed by the Romans, by Titus. And so in Matthew 24, um, verses 15 to 20, he says, he just gave us a whole series. He mixed truths about what was going to happen immediately ahead with truths that were going to happen immediately before his second coming. But you, what would have happened? Well, let's say the instruction was when you see the city surrounded by infidels, by the pagans, it's for you as my followers, this is a warning, leave. I mean, don't come and take your whole, everything you own, just come, don't even, if you haven't, don't have your cloak, don't even come back and get it, just get out, leave. And well, that was interesting because they were surrounded by the Romans and, and uh, how could they get out? Well, seemingly almost miraculously, the Roman general withdrew and the Jewish defenders of the city rushed out, followed them, and suddenly, there was an open door for the early Christians to leave. Amen. And did they? Yes. Would they have if Christ hadn't forewarned them of what to do? Pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath or in the winter time, but it was not the Sabbath. And it was not the winter, and the opportunity came. And interestingly enough, in the dead book, Desire of Ages, the Christians obeyed the warning, and not a Christian perished in the fall of that city. Whoa. I mean, not a Christian perished. I mean, we we would have read, <laughs> if I had been true to the lesson, 3,000 first, 5,000 men plus children and women and ch became Christians. A lot of the early core of the Christian church was in Judea, which when the Romans came would have flocked to the city. If the early Christians had not been forewarned by Christ and left, the core of the early Christian church would have been annihilated in the destruction that was coming upon uh, Jerusalem. And in fact, they were spared that. And the core of the early Christian church within one day, found themselves out of the city, up into the mountains, away from the, the uh, Roman army that came in and sacked the city. Not one stone was left on another. The, the temple was destroyed. People were killed by the thousands, men, women, and children. And not one Christian lost their lives. Uh, Christian, what does that mean? Who, who were Christians? Those who followed Christ and believed him when he said, time to flee, you have a comment. Well, that was my comment. Um, so you have the Passover experience in the Old Testament where anyone who had chosen to slay the lamb and put the blood over the doorpost was preserved. Right. Here we have again, anyone who chose to believe enough to act, in other words, to leave, right. they were saved. 
So we have this repeated again now here in the last days where we're going to have to believe enough to trust God's word no matter what. Even though we can't explain why we should stand where we stand, we stand because God says so. What does my watch say? It says that I, I've run four minutes over, over time, haven't I? Whoa, <laughs> oh. I have so much more to share. Oh well, anyway, it, my, my time is up. The good <laughs> superintendent is smiling, but she must I, be a little forgiving because I wasn't yeah. looking at my watch. And here we are. May you know, the it's, Lord bless us today. Uh, <laughs> yes, you have a comment, sir. Yeah, um, just real quick. Um, so when Christ made that prediction or told us what to do, from the date, the distance and time there, 30 some years, right? Yeah. They must have been reading the Bible or reading the book of Matthew, the text, to be able to know that, right? You would think after 30 some years, people would have forgotten. So people, but people were rehearsing it and remembering it and they were talking about it, right? Yeah. 30 some years could go by and people would forget that he said that. Except. Well, except they you're were right. they, they kept their nose they, in the book. Then they, yeah, and, they, and there is so what is called oral tradition as well to reinforce the written tradition. So that what was happening was a fulfillment. The conditions now were set. And then all of a sudden the opportunity opened up before them and they took it. So I think that's a good point. Okay, let's, let's my handouts that I was about to share. I think I'm gonna still ask the deacons to share them. Um, let me give a little background, I'm sorry. In September, I began it to my 25 neighbors to share devotionals with them. So this week I shared the eighth devotional that I've been sharing to my 25 neighbors, and it's on health. Um, oh, the pastor just slipped out the door. I was going to say, um, okay, you got it. Thank you. So, so I have given, this is the eighth little devotional, and it's just a one-page message, and it happens to be, and I've gone, I've lost three of my neighbors who've declined my devotionals, and the other 22 have seemed to really appreciate them, and I visited door-to-door -door with them this week, giving this little message, <clears throat> and uh, I thought, if they would, my neighbors would enjoy it, maybe you would enjoy it as well. So I brought it, and thank you so much. <laughs> okay, thank you, and thank I apologize you. for running over. That's okay, before. thank you so much. Um, you know, he said he was reading out the clear word. Elder Blanco used to be the, uh, the pastor at Woodbury Church in New Jersey where I went. And when I took this last verse out of, the, out of the Bible, I took it from the clear word because I write to my grandchildren a verse from the clear word. I'm going through the uh, Bible with them every day because I know it's easier for them to comprehend than the regular Bible. But anyway, our story today was about that man who uh, didn't realize what he had done and his wife was calling it quits. So this verse came to my mind when I was going through the Bible. It said in Jeremiah 2, 1 through 4, and he said, go, he cried, go. The angel gives this message for me to Jerusalem. Who's Jerusalem? Us, right? And to my people who live there, tell them, the Lord says, remember how faithful you were when you were young, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness through the land not cultivated. That was by faith they followed him. You were special to me. You belonged to me and to no one else. 
You were the first fruits of the harvest to come. You were my sacred possession. All who touched you were guilty and disaster overtook them. So remember, like he said, in the last days, like with that building, do you, what do you think? Sometimes they might not have been reading all that scripture, but you know, the Holy Spirit prompts us. It's time to go. Remember, and then the voice will come back. Oh yeah, that verse. We gotta get out of here. This is our, this is our opening. That's how God works. I know that's the way he works in my life. He works that in everybody's life. And he's so faithful and loving. So let's have a prayer because we're trying to wrap this up early because we we have people coming for lunch and we want to get done. So I'm just going to say a little prayer right here. Dear Heavenly Father, you bless us beyond measure. There's nothing, Father, that you wouldn't do for us because you love us so much. We're so thankful, Lord, for all the blessings that we receive. And let the Holy Spirit prompt us to know your will when it's time and what to do. And help us to be keen on listening to it. Let us be ready and preparing ourselves for that voice. We pray this all in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Amen.